This is wonderful because for me, it's coming home. So it was almost 50 years ago that I was sitting in a, in a seat not unlike where you are, having arrived with visions of sugar plums dancing in my head, <laughs> much like you. And so I come today, first of all, because for me it's coming home, because this is the place that grew me up, that enabled me to grow up, this Eastman School of Music. I grew up here. This is the place that let me fall down and make mistakes and scratch my knee and put, put Vaseline on it. <laughs> this is the place where the faculty grabbed me by the nape of the neck and made me get up again. This is the place where the conductor of the Philharmonia pointed to me and said, let me hear, let me hear it from letter B, Burgett. <laughs> if you haven't had that happen, you will. <laughs> but this is the place that grew me up and while I haven't been here the entire half century almost, I've been here for most of it because I was a student for 10 years and I've been a dean and professor and vice president for 31. So coming here is coming home. And when I look at that, first of all, uh, at all of you, the first thing that I must do is pay my respects to you. And I pay my respects to you quite seriously. I always, with students, and especially with my Eastman students, is pay my respects. Because you, all of you, are going to be in positions at some point that are going to be like mine. I wasn't the sharpest pencil in the box, and I wasn't the greatest violinist. Oh, I've got to tell you that story. So I arrive in Rochester at the Eastman School this regional treasure from St. Louis, Missouri. Any St. Louisans? You go, girl. All right. Where'd you go to high school? Well, it's like two hours out. Oh, two hours out. Okay. That's close enough, though. That's close enough. So that makes us family, right? Okay. <laughs> so this regional treasure arrives from St. Louis, Missouri. And I'll never forget my arrival. We still have an orientation commi uh, committee. Do, do we, Dr. Bush? EOC? Yeah. Eastman Orientation Committee? So the orientation committee was welcoming us, and first words out of my mouth were, <clears throat> well, would you point me to the um, practice rooms, please? They did. Because you see, I was coming to the Eastman School, and Rochester, New York was um, a detour for me. I had visions of violinistic sugar plums dancing in my head, because Rochester was a detour on the way to New York and other capitals of the world, where I would metamorphose from a national to an even international treasure. I was already a regional treasure, just like all of you. So I went up to the practice rooms. I'd never seen a building like that. And I went into one of them, and it was just us freshmen who were here, just like you. And I went into the practice room, took my fiddle out, tuned it up, put the music on the stand, began to play. Vitali Chacon. Let me see a violin. Anybody know the tune? Anybody know the Vitali Chacon? You know the Vitali? Beautiful, big piece, right? Big, I mean, I mean, it's a muscular piece, isn't it? It's really grand. I mean, it makes you sound like a million dollars, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what I, I use that for my, for my audition. So I start playing, <clears throat> not really practicing. I'm just playing, playing this. The first day there, right? It's just as freshman. And I leave the practice room door open just a little bit. I want all within earshot to appreciate this regional treasure that has arrived. <laughs> that lasts until the sophomores, juniors, seniors, graduate students, and faculty arrive. At which point, I have a moment of epiphany. My whole notion of talent gets radically redefined. I pull that practice room door shut, push that handle down. Y'all know. Put a piece of paper over the window and a bag over my head so nobody can see who's making all that noise. <laughs> And then I huddled in the student living center, which was not this building, but another someplace else, waiting for the second letter from the admissions office, the one in the thin envelope, the one telling me that a terrible mistake had been made, that the Paul Burgett they really intended to admit could play the violin and the Vitalik Chacon, and asking if I might leave under the cover of darkness to spare us all the embarrassment. <laughs> and thus did my arrival 
begin. Thus did I have that moment of epiphany. And in years subsequent, my years as dean here, oh, how much fun I had with students as we talked about the moment. The moment when, despite our tremendous experiences beforehand, all of which you've had, you know, interlocking and, and, and uh, the, the, the countless experience, Tanglewood and all the stuff, you, you've all done all that stuff, and I, I had done it too. But suddenly, I had entered Yankee Stadium, a musical Yankee Stadium, where everybody was good, and many, if not most, were better than I. And so I huddled fearfully in those early days because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Suddenly my whole notion that, hmm, becoming the concertmaster of Philadelphia, Hell's Bells becoming Last Stand Philadelphia, uh, might not be in the future for me, might not. So I began to think in bigger ways. I had come to a place that was bigger than I. I was certainly this regional treasure in St. Louis, just like all of you were regional treasures from wherever, just like you. What town? Cape Girardeau. Cape Girardeau, yeah, so south, right? Yep, and you were a regional treasure in Cape Girardeau, weren't you? Yes, you, you were hot stuff, weren't you? Yep, and when you got admitted to the Eastman School of Music, it was, you know, lots of celebration, right? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. And the expectations, because the whole community is sending you off because you are indeed the regional treasure that you had become through lots of hard work and opportunity. My sister followed me to the University of Rochester, not here, but to the River Campus. She was pre-med. She had visions of medical sugar plums dancing in her head, and I'll never forget when she went, I went over to have dinner with her on the River Campus. If you, you've not made it to the River Campus yet, because it's still fairly early in your time here, eventually you must. And I went to visit her. She's one of the smartest people in the world. I, my sister is truly brilliant. And she was pre-med biology. So I went over and I'm having dinner with her. And she's really glum. And I'm her older brother. So I looked at her and I said, what's the problem? What's the matter? She said, well, I'm taking the hardest course I've ever taken in my life. I'd never heard her say that. She was so smart. And I thought, what could that possibly be? She's the sort of person who could learn by osmosis. You, know, you just hold the book up to her. I'm exaggerating, of course, but you just hold the book up to her and she sort of, it would get there. <laughs> so, you know, there are people like that, right? And so, and so I said, what in the world could it possibly be? She said, this is the hardest course I've ever taken in my life. I have no idea what the professor is talking about. I said, what is it? Organic chemistry. <laughs> that was her moment of epiphany. That was her that was her practice room moment. That was, that was the moment that she began to understand that the world was a whole lot larger than the regional treasuredom that each of us in our own ways had occupied prior to coming here. But I stayed at Eastman, I stayed here. So why did I stay? And she stayed as a biology major at the River Campus. She stayed there, and eventually she went on and became a, became a physician. She's been a doc for years. And I, st and I decided to stay at Eastman. Why did I decide to stay? Why did I stay here? Why did I stay here? I stayed for one, two reasons. I stayed for two reasons, and so will you, almost all of you. One, because I'm a musician. I love music. I adore it. Yes, I'm a vice president, and yes, I'm a dean. But I love music. The lens that I chose to grind for myself, through which I would look at the world, the way I would understand myself, and the way I would understand the world, was through the lens of music. I, just, I loved it. I was passionate about it. I liked talking about it. I liked being with people who, I got to this place, and I found that I didn't have to explain myself to anybody. I didn't, it was just simply understood. Music was the totem that, to which all of us, all of us were drawn. So I loved being with music, fellow musicians. I loved talking about music. I loved playing. I hated practicing. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Uh, but I couldn't think of anything that I would rather do than to be in this environment, number one. So I was passionate about it, and two, I was good at it. I knew 
that I wasn't going to be the best in the world. I knew that fairly quickly from, the, from that, that um, practice room experience that I just described for you. I knew that probably wasn't going to happen, but um, and I also knew that it was going to happen for some of my friends and colleagues who were surrounding me. But, I was, but I'd gotten here. I'd gotten into this wonderful place. And so passion and ability are fundamental principles about the decision to be where you are. I, on the River Campus, um, as a faculty member, I advise freshmen and sophomores. And what they hear from me, and these are not music majors, these are, they're not majors of anything yet. But what they hear from me again and again is passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. I still give pizza parties in the dorms on the river campus, and I always choose one of the freshmen, and I, and I, and I lay out that liturgy, and I say, and, I get, I, and, and, and then I get the entire floor, because we're having pizza and drinking Cokes, and say, passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. Say, passion and ability drive ambition. Now, passion and ability drive ambition, and... Passion and ability drive ambition. And... Passion and ability drive ambition. And... And passion and ability drive ambition. Whoa, I love to do that with these students. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. And we could probably do some polyphonic, we could probably do some counterpoint with it, but, I, I, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll, I'll demur. We won't do that. Passion and ability drive ambition. So I stayed. So I stayed not being terribly sure what was going to happen. So then what happened? So I decided I was going to stay. They'd asked me to come, I came, I'd made these early discoveries, and I decided I was going to stay. So what do I know about this experience? This, this, this quantum leap, this quantum intellectual and musical leap that I had made that you are in the process of making. So what happens in these four years that will go by quickly? Did high school go by fairly quickly? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not like grade school, right? Elementary school is elementary school and middle school. It feels like you're, it's never going to end, right? I give talks to third and fourth and fifth graders, and I always like to say to them, you know, they're these little people, right? And and so, and I like to say to them, does it feel like you've been in school forever? And they go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I say, do you ever sometimes feel like the fourth grade is never going to end? And they say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I say, don't worry, it will. And then you get to high school, and boom, it goes by fairly quickly. This only gets faster. I mean, Einstein really was right about time. And it just goes and goes and goes. But so what, what is it all about? What do I know? What can I tell you? I've told you of that passion and ability drive ambition. And by the way, when I say that passion and ability drive ambition, I, I really do think that your major doesn't matter. Your major really doesn't matter. Passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. Your major doesn't matter. I mean, to be a great pianist, you don't have to be a piano major. Now, it's true in most instances that, pa that your major doesn't matter. If you want to be an electrical engineer, you need to be an electrical engineering major because there are licensing issues associated with it. But, you know, but, but, but for most of us, including you, the major matters less than the identification of what your passion is and ability which drive ambition. Those, I think, are the most important first order principles to contemplate, to consider. Well, what I've come to understand about this experience, this undergraduate experience, is that I think it is about the confrontation with ideas. Musical, in your case, musical and otherwise. The confrontation with ideas, that's a big, I, that's a big notion. Because the confrontation with ideas is a revolutionary idea. It's a transformative idea. Uh, the confrontation with ideas is, is something that goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The confrontation with ideas is as, is as interesting as looking at several editions of uh, Bach part, part, uh, Sonatas and Partitas and, and trying to understand uh, why uh, why the, why one edition, how one edition differs from the other, and most importantly, why. I'll never forget in one of my, one of my lessons, one of my violin lessons, I was, I was doing the, um, the, Bach, the Bach first uh, sonata, the G minor, and, and, and my teacher, Miller Taylor, who's the late Miller Taylor, who was chair of the, of the string department, he looked at me, I'd done something, and I, can't, I, can't, I don't remember all the details, but he, he looked at me and he said, why did you do that? And I, 
Ooh, I, don't, I don't know why I did it, you know? And he said, you know, I think maybe you need to think about why you, why you did that. You need, to, you need to think more deeply about why you're doing what you're doing musically. So the conference, and it, it, it never occurred to me. I had simply played. But now you're asking me to think also. Hmm, okay. Uh, and it's only as I took his message to heart that I began to understand that, you know, practicing, you know, most of us, do, mo most of us practice dumb. We do. You know, we practice dumb. I mean, to practice smart, to practice smart is really hard work. And once I started practicing smart, that, that was painful. I mean, that was practicing smart meant getting done in an hour what I had spent three hours doing. That's what practicing smart is, is in part about and understanding it. It's an intellectual process. It's a transform. It's a revolutionary process. So it can be as simple as something like I just described or as difficult. It can be this, this confrontation with ideas may have something to do with what your political beliefs are, what your religious beliefs are, what your sexual orientation is. I've been a dean of students, I was a dean of students for 20 years, and I had the great privilege of students had invited me into their lives in connection with this confrontation with ideas. Confrontation with ideas that take place at two o'clock in the morning, and those of you living in the Student Living Center, which I helped design, by the way, when I was dean of students here, so I can take the credit, thank you very much. <laughs> um, the, 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 those conversations that go on at two o'clock in the morning, you're already having them. Gosh, this is cool, man. There ain't no grown-ups around to tell me what I have to do. So let's just keep talking, you know? So conversations that go on at two o'clock in the morning about all manner of things, and two o'clock in the afternoon. I had a student say to me once, um, uh, he was going home for Thanksgiving, and I said, oh, you're looking forward to going home for Thanksgiving? He said, well, I'm not so sure. This is not here, this is the River Campus. He said, I'm not so sure. I said, why? He said, well, you know, we have conversations around the dinner table with my family. He said, and I'm, I've been taking political science courses, and you know, my father is really a dyed-in-the-wool, deeply conservative Republican, and I'm not. <laughs> so I can only imagine what those conversations are going to be like. So, this confrontation with ideas, this transformative experience is what this is about. And it won't always be fun. It's going to hurt. You're going to suffer. There will be pain. What do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? It's going to be pain. I've been having fun up to this point, right? I like to use the image of the fiery furnace, and thus does do my remarks today take the title Fiery Furnace? It had a different title when I used to talk to freshmen when I was dean here. The students on the River Campus have given it the, t the name Fiery Furnace for the following reason. This revolutionary experience, this confrontation with ideas that takes place, it occurred to me one day as I was thinking about it, the image of the biblical fiery furnace suddenly appeared in my imagination. This huge rectangular thing that was blazing hot. It was white hot. And, and tell me your name. Bailey. Bailey. Bailey standing in front of this fiery furnace. And the door flies open. And it's so hot, it's just pulsing. And the flames lick out of this furnace and singe your eyebrow, your lovely eyebrow hairs. It just, it just burns them right off. <laughs> and you look over your shoulder and you say to Dr. Bush, who's your teacher? Wait, which teacher? What, what's your instrument? Trumpet. Trump, uh, Thompson. Okay, Thompson. <laughs> so you look at him and you say, it's... It's hot in there. You know, when your embouchure is just is messing up, it's just not, it ain't working, right? And uh, you say, it's hot in there. You say to Dr. Bush, Some, something's gone wrong. And what we will say, or you say to me, you call me up, you say, well, I now know a vice president at the University of Rochester, so, and he's one of us. He told us he was. So, so you say, such and such and so and so. The fiery furnace is open, and it's hot. And we will say to you, Bailey, right, step right in. And you will. You will step right in and we'll close that door behind you. And that fiery furnace will be any of a number of things. It will be the trumpet. Let me see an oboist. That, those reeds? Those reeds? I don't have a reed! <laughs> right? I, can't, I don't have a reed, I'm going to shoot myself. Right? <laughs> I feel your pain. I really do. I don't have a reed. Or, oh my God, the muscles in my hand hurt. The muscles in my hand are hurting. What's, what's going on? What's going on there? 
Well, you have tendonitis. Oh, well, I'm tilted off my, I'm tilted off balance. I mean, how I understand myself is changed because I don't have a read or my embouchure or God, doggone it, I got a split lip. It's no fun, is it? Mm -mm. And all the blistex in the world doesn't heal it fast enough, does it? Mm -mm. No. Um, so you will be in that fiery furnace. Or, you know what? I thought I was going to be the world's next greatest flutist, but now I'm not so sure that that's what I'm going to do because I love English literature. I really love English literature a lot. And I find myself drawn to English literature, as a student said to me last year, who actually transferred from the Eastman School to the English department in the College of Arts and Science. We had a fantastic conversation about the tensions, the intellectual and emotional tension associated with, with her looking at the larger landscape of opportunities and options and where passion and ability were coinciding, were coming together. So standing in that fiery furnace, Bailey, with the door closed, I can promise you one thing, you will not die. You will not burn up. And eventually, you will open the door and you will step out of the furnace strong. You will step out of the furnace tempered like steel with whatever the challenge might have been. When I was a student in my junior year here, I took a course, part of the humanities. You know, we all have, all have our humanities requirement, right? Oboists, we have our humanities requirement. So I, I saw a course that was entitled Existentialism. I thought, oh man, what a cool word that is. That is really a cool word. And I have no idea what it means. <laughs> so I thought, I'll... I'll take the course. I need, I need it to support my humanities requirements, so I'll take it. So I took this course in existentialism. Now, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, same state as Cape Girardeau over here, as a devout Roman Catholic. Catholic educated all the way until I got to, uh, to Rochester. And I took this course in existential thought. This course completely turned me inside out. It did things to me intellectually. It forced me to contemplate who I was in this world and what my beliefs were. My entire being was challenged in ways that it had never been challenged before. And it was based on one short story in that course. That course, we did a lot of reading for this course, and you know how that goes, all the readings you gotta do, right, is keeping you out of the practice rooms. I understand all that, I do. But there was one short story in that course which presented me with the furnace, the fiery furnace, in a way that I couldn't, I, that had never occurred to me. An idea which had simply never occurred to me that changed me for the rest of my life. That's what you want to have happen. What's going to happen here with the confrontation with ideas in the fiery furnace is you're going to be exposed to ideas, musical and otherwise. That's what needs to happen. I once got a phone call from a, from a journalist in New York who was doing an article on student happiness and she, so she, she's going on in a kind of silly way, you know, about, well, you're the dean and so you're interested in students and student happiness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to her on the phone, I said, no, I'm not. I'm not interested in student happiness. Well, said, long dead silence. And she said, you're not? I said, nope. She said, look, I'm going to be in Rochester in a couple weeks. Can I come talk to you? I said, sure. So she came to see me. She said, you said you're not interested in student happiness. I said, look, are students happy? Of course they are. They're among the happiest and the healthiest pe and the smartest people on the planet. Consider this, if you will. Of adult Americans over the age of 25 who hold a bachelor's degree, the percentage is what, Brett, Bailey? Just give me a number, any number. You don't know, but I mean, and that's fine. Just what, what would pop into your head? 80. 80%. 80 percent of adult Americans over the age of 25 hold a bachelor's degree. Well, in fact, the number's 29.4. 
okay? 29.4%. You are the best and the brightest, there's no question about it. And of the 29.4% of the, of the who hold a bachelor's degree, uh, over the age of 25 who hold a bachelor's degree, about seven, slightly more than 7% hold an advanced degree, which all of you will at some point. 7%, slightly more than 7%. And of that 7%, about 1.5% hold a degree beyond the master's degree, which many of you will. You are amongst the brightest, the best equipped, the best prepared human beings on the planet. That's the fact of the matter. In fact, somebody has to succeed me, Bailey, if not you. <laughs> Who? And students always laugh when I say that. You might someday be the dean of the Eastman School of Music. It might happen. If someone had said that to me when I was a freshman, I would say they were crazy. But it might happen. But one has to go into the furnace for it to happen. And you will go into the furnace. And you will not vaporize or burn up. And I promise you that we will never abandon you as you become stronger, smarter, and more able, as you pursue your passion and ability, which will drive your ambition. Our responsibility to you as our our responsibility to you, our successors, is never to abandon you. And you will step out of that furnace, as did I, as did Dean Lowry, as did President Seligman, stronger, smarter, and more ready to take on the responsibilities of whatever your passion and ability drive you to do. So what do you have to do to get out of this joint? Well, you gotta practice. And smart, right? You gotta practice smart. I'll never forget the freshman who came into my office. She was a flutist. She came into my office and she was really ticked off at having to take the freshman writing course. She said, I didn't know I was coming to the Eastman School of English. I, I'll never forget that. That's what she said. I didn't know I was coming to the Eastman School of English. And I said, she said, I'm not getting my, I don't know, six hours a day in. I said, what are you up there doing in the practice room? I said, don't even answer that. I know what you're up there doing. And I told her what she was up there doing. I said, you have to figure out how to get those notes under your fingers in ways that enable you to do it efficiently and quickly. Because when you get under the world, the world not gonna, is not going to allow for that kind of, for that, the luxury of the kind of time that we have here. So the confrontation with ideas in all manner, in all formats, is really what this is all about. And to get out of this joint, there are three things you gotta do. I like to think in threes, trios. There are three things you have to do. One, you have to learn how to access and apprehend data, in some cases create the data, which we call research. And that is as true of musicians as it is of anybody else. I once had a freshman advisee who came into my office. He was very, very upset. This is on the River Campus. It was not here at Eastman. He came into my office. He was very upset. He was a freshman. He had been brilliant in school, in high school, and he'd been the captain of his soccer team. And he showed me his freshman writing paper, and it was just all covered with red. He said, I thought I knew how to write, and look at this. This is a mess. And um, he said, I, I was captain of my high school soccer team, and, and um, all, I'm doing, all my butt's doing is warming the bench here. Um, he had in his hand a Time magazine. And the Time Magazine had a review of a new biography of Scott Joplin. Who, who knows who Scott Joplin was? Oh, good, okay. Scott Joplin, for those of you who don't know, referred to as the father of ragtime piano. Great ragtime composer of the late 19th and early 20th century, died in 1917. But very, very important Scott Joplin. So there was a new biography. So this student said to me, um, you know, I was reading this, um, this, this review of this biography, it looks really interesting. Uh, and so I was talking to some students, they said, your area of work and what I teach I, on the River Campus, I teach the history of jazz. Imagine that. I teach the history of jazz. I have a class right now with 100 students. I teach the history of jazz. If you had said to me, Bailey, when I was here sawing away on the, box, on the Vitali Chacon, that I would be teaching the history of jazz, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. But what drove my getting from that to, to teaching the history of jazz? Passion and ability drove the ambition. So, and I also teach a course called The Music of Black Americans which was what I did my dissertation as a PhD student here at the Eastman School. So I teach those things on the River Campus, in the music department. So this student said, people told me that you're the guy to talk to about Scott Joplin. I said, yeah, okay, sure. So he said, I wanna know more about it. So I gave him a reading list. And uh, I said, you go read these, you go read these books. So he went off and I thought, I wonder if I'll ever see him again. Well, he, he, he came back. 
He came back to my office. He had read them. Eventually, he was a freshman, by the way. This was a freshman student. So he, so he um, um, eventually he said to me, you know, Dean Burgett, I have an idea. I'm going to apply for a National Endowment for the Humanities Young Scholars Fellowship because I want to do research into Scott Joplin. He was a freshman. I said, Joel, um, Joel Helfrich is his name. I said, Joel, um, you're, you're really not, this will be a real stretch. I, I didn't want to encourage him too much because it was a real stretch. These, these grants usually go to graduate students and seniors. Uh, they're federal grants. He said, but I have an idea. I said, what's the idea? He said, I want to do research into, into Scott Joplin's opera, Tremonitia, because I have an idea about the significance, the social significance, he was not a musician, the social significance that, that is embedded in the libretto of that opera. And I thought, hmm, hadn't thought about that. So he composed the, uh, the, the application form, and he said to me, Dean Burgett, you've, you've got to be my advisor. I said, okay, I will. You got to write a letter of recommendation. So I wrote a letter of recommendation, and I said, he doesn't know very much yet, but he's really interesting, and he's got a really great idea. So Joel put all of his materials together, and off he went. And I remember saying to my secretary, I wonder if we'll ever see Joel again. Two months later, three months later, he came running into my office with a letter from the director of the NEH. He'd gotten the grant. He'd gotten the grant. And the grant was to do, this, to do a study of the, of the libretto of, of the opera Tremonitia, uh, under the supervision of Professor Burgett, and it was really cool because they gave him, it was a summer, summer uh, grant, and he got $3,000, which was really terrific. Boy, talk about an easy job. And you know what? His advisor did too, which made it <laughs> really good for me. So he did a paper. And he worked and he worked, where he got through the summer, paper wasn't done, and I beat on him, beat on him, and beat on him, and he looked at me and said, well, this never end. So he continued to work on it. The paper that he produced was so good that the Scott Joplin Society invited him to Sedalia, Missouri, and then to St. Louis, because that's where Scott Joplin hailed from originally, to read his paper, and then the next year to participate in a panel on a discussion of Scott Joplin. This is somebody who was a sophomore and a junior. Susan Curtis was the author of that biography, whose, the review of which had appeared in Time magazine. She wrote me a letter, and she said, your student, Joel Helfrich, has added to our understanding about Scott Joplin. That's what you have to do here. And when I teach my Music of Black Americans course, and I get to Scott Joplin, I do an analysis of Tremonisha that was provided by a freshman student. So, accessing and apprehending data, in some cases creating the data, we call that research. That's the first thing you got to do here. You've got to do that. Two, you have to develop skills of analysis. You got to know how to take the thing apart and put it back together again. I know theory class can be a real pain in the butt, but you've got to do it. You've got to learn, you have to learn the mechanics of the art. You have to understand the mechanics of the art by taking it apart and putting it back together again. I look back. I don't have any regrets. I, have, I, I don't think of my life in terms of regrets. I do th sometimes think in terms of how I might have done things better if I had a chance to do it over, which I don't. Developing skills of analysis are critically important, critically important. So that's the second thing you gotta do to get out of this joint. The third thing you have to do is learn to express yourself. You have to learn to express yourself. When you have, accessed and apprehended data, and in some cases created it, like I just described my Scott Joplin student, and then when you've done the, 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 te the technical process of, an of analysis, it can be said that you know something. Knowing something is not trivial. Knowing something is really important. To say that you know something, that is really, really important. I know something, and once you know something, 29.4% of the of the educated adult population. You have a responsibility to enunciate it. You have a responsibility to tell the world. You have a responsibility to report what you know. That's what your faculty does here. Your faculty here reports what it knows. And what it knows comes from accessing and apprehending data, in some cases creating that data, and then work, 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 intelligent work. And then they express what they know, and you get to experience that every week when you go into your lesson, or when you go into the theory class, or when you go into one of your humanities courses, or one of your music history courses. 
That's what you have to do to get out of this joint. Access and apprehend data in some cases. Create it where the opportunity exists and don't miss that opportunity. Don't miss, like my student Joel Helfrich, he got interested in something and it happened to be Scott Joplin and he decided to pursue it. By the way, he looked at me at one point after all of this happened and he said, you know, this has been such a rewarding experience. I think I want to continue to do historical scholarship. And he now has a PhD in American history. You never know where it's going to lead. You never know where it's going to lead. So those three things, as you think about what you're doing here, I encourage you not to think about them mindlessly, but in the context of passion and ability driving ambition. Passion and ability driving ambition and then doing and, and focusing on those three uh, ideas, accessing and apprehending data in some cases, creating it, developing skills of analysis, which is really woodshedding. It's woodshedding. And then expressing what you know and expressing it verbally, expressing it musically, expressing it graphically. That's what you have to do. Well, okay, so you've done all of this. You've gone through all of this. You've been in the furnace, in the fiery furnace, and you've come out. And you've gone back in, and you've come back out. You've gone back in, and you've come back out. A stronger, educated person. So where does that lead? Where does that lead? I'm going to give you two heresies. I'm going to give you two heresies, and I believe these heresies are, are, I believe these heresies are absolutely true, and I think that the world at large struggles with accepting these heresies. But you're so important that I'm going to give you these heresies anyway and invite you to just tuck them into your back pocket and remind yourself of them. The first heresy I've sort of already given you by saying your major doesn't really matter. Your major doesn't matter. Passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. Bravo. The second our hope for you, after all of this magnificent education, and don't tell your parents I said this, please. Our hope for you is that you never have a job. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, huh? You know why I don't want you to tell mom and dad, right? Because parents. Understandably, when all of this is over with this investment, when you walk across that stage to, to have Dean Lowry hand you that uh, diploma, you want, your folks want to see J-O-B somewhere, right? J-O-B somewhere. I'm one of you. I've never had a job. Oh, I have a job. Sure. But in the sense that I intended you were so important that thinking only in terms of a job is not sufficient. It's not enough. You, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your community, you know it to the nation, and you owe it to the world to think in terms of a life of work and service. And in that regard, I'm going to offer you three more thoughts. Careers evolve. You're limited principally by three elements. The first, your capacity to invent. Dreaming the thing up. Capacity to invent is so important. Being imaginative and dreaming is absolutely important. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, and don't let anybody let considerations of the practical mute or dull your ability to dream. Quick story. When I was an undergraduate, we had a terrible, terrible uh, war that was going on, the Vietnam War, and we had a military draft. And guys, the guys were, we, we were all terrified. We were especially terrified that we might get drafted, because if you got drafted, you lost control of what might happen to you, and Vietnam was not a place we wanted to go. We didn't believe in the war. The war was incredibly unpopular, and history has proven that to have been true. So guys at East, what were guys at Eastman doing? Guys at Eastman, they were getting into military bands. So, you know, the, the military bands were the best military bands they probably have ever been, uh, thanks to graduates of the Eastman School. Well, you know, I'm, I'm feeling the hot breath of my draft board on, my, on, on the back of my neck once I graduate, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? When I discovered that there was an army band in Rochester, New York. So I went to the band headquarters. Well, there was a guy in that band who was in my class here who was a friend of mine. Jerry Nywood by name, a great, a great alto saxophonist who had a beautiful career in New York as a, as a, as a, as a, as a jazz sideman, lots of albums and stuff. But so Jerry was in the, Jerry, Jerry was in the band. I said, Jerry, you got to get me in this band, man, because I'm about to get drafted. He looked at me and he said, but, but Paul, you're a violinist. This is a band. 
I said, yeah, but I played flute in high school. He said, oh, you did? <laughs> Not very well, but I did. He said, I'll see what I can do. So I don't know what kind of arms he twisted or lies he told or bribes he, he paid. But the next thing I knew, I was in this man's Army Band, the 98th Division Army Band in Rochester, New York. So I went to basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Then I went to Fort Meade, Maryland, where I got my flute chops back by playing with the 1st Army Band, because it had been a long time since I played flute. And I came back to Rochester, joined the band, I reported for duty. The commanding officer looked at me, and he said, Burgett, I don't really need another flute player. I'm going, oh my God. He said, I need a tubist. <laughs> Think of the yin yang, right? He said, I need a tuba player. I said, sir, I don't play the tuba. I'll never forget what he said to me. I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, aren't you a graduate of the Eastman School? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, there's a tuba. <laughs> and then it hit me. This is a marching band. It's not the world's greatest band. It's not one of the bands in DC. There's a band in Little Rochester, New York. It's a marching band. I need two notes. <laughs> I need two notes. I need a brass player to help me with my embouchure. And remember, I was violin in music education, and I said, music education, don't fail me now. <laughs> so I became a tuba player in the Army Band. He didn't tell me he needed an F-16 fighter pilot. He needed a tuba player. And he did not need the world's greatest tuba player, and so I played tuba. And I knew that I, that I had developed some chops when one year, my second year, I guess, in the band, he hauled up, at, when we were in sort of uh, concert band uh, format, he hauled up the, uh, the, the, the whole suite, the first whole suite. <laughs> For those of you who know it, it opens with a tuba lick, right? Ticka, ticka, ticka. And I said, damn, you know, I could have done this too. Your capacity to invent is really, really important. Your willingness to work is the second. Your willingness to work is absolutely important. And three, a little luck. Luck is not luck like winning the lottery. Luck is being in the right place at the right time and knowing it. That's critically important. How did I become a vice president? I was a dean here. I was, I was perfectly happy. I was a dean here at the Eastman School. I'd been a product of the institution through t for 10 years through three degrees. One day, the director of the Eastman School said to me, you know, you could be the dean of students at the Eastman School for the rest of your professional career. And with those words, I decided to leave. I decided to leave because I knew the piece. The Vitali Chacon, as an analogy, I, I had it down. I really had it down. The president of the university learned I was thinking about leaving. He plucked me from my musical soil and asked me to reorchestrate my tune for a larger ensemble. As vice president and university dean of students in 1987. The job didn't exist, there was no office, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do, but I knew I loved students. I knew that I could, I could continue to teach in the music department there. I could continue to, I could continue to claim my identity as a musician and I would be able to spend it, spend time with a huge array of students. So after thinking about it for two days, I said yes. And then I spent the next 13 years figuring it out. I spent the next 13 years learning the notes. And it's one of the most exciting things that ever happened to me. Your capacity to invent, your willingness to work, and a little luck. One of your number, when I was dean here, Joe Bonanno, and I'm going to end with this because we're almost at the end, are we? One of your number, Joe Bonanno, when I was dean, Joe came to see me in his sophomore year. He was a horn player. He was a good horn player. He got a PC. So Joe came to see me in his sophomore year. He said, you know, I love the horn. And Dean Brigitte, you always say, you know, passion and ability driving business. That's why I'm here because I love the horn so much. He said, but I also like business. I like quantitative sorts of stuff. My father's a businessman and I work for him in the summertime. And, but I don't know how to satisfy, satisfy my interest uh, for business. I said, well, Joe, look, you're at a great university. Why don't you go to the River Campus and as part of your humanities requirements for your BM degree, why don't you take an economics course, take an accounting course, take a math course? Joe did that. In his senior year, he came to see me. He said, you know, I'm thinking, I'm about to graduate, and I think I got three options. There are three options that I could pursue. One, I could pursue a master in MMPRL, Master of Music and Performance and Literature, which essentially is to continually doing at a higher level what I'm already doing. Two, I could audition for horn gigs. Or three, I could get an MBA. He said, I think I want to get an MBA. I said, okay, Joe, well, where are you going to apply? This is what he said. Harvard, Cornell, Penn, or the Wharton School at, at uh, Penn, 
And the University of Chicago, I, I gasped. I said, those are only four of the highest ranked business schools in the country. He said, yeah, but I only have to have one of them accept me. Will you write, will you write a letter of recommendation to help get me in? I said, sure, so I did. Cornell accepted him. So off he goes to Ithaca, New York, and he calls me up. Dean Bergat, this is really great. I'm, I, here I am, this guy, this horn player in the business school, and he said, what's really great is I'm getting all the really good horn gigs in, uh, in Ithaca. I said, terrific, Joe. The next semester he calls me up, he says, hey, Dean Bergat, you know, I'm taking a law course, I'm taking a corporate law course, I really like it. And, um, if, and Cornell has this program where in four years, if I can get into the law school in four years, I can earn not only my MBA, but I can earn a JD as well. You write, will you write me a letter to get me into the law school? I said, sure, I'm happy to do that. I did. After the admission cycle was over, Joe calls me, and he got into the law school. He said, this is really great. He said, I got one foot in the business school, I got one foot in the law school, and he said, and guess what the teaching assistantship is to pay for all this? I said, what, Joe? He said, giving horn lessons. He graduated, um, and he graduated with a degree, with a, uh, a JD and an MBA in 1989, and I then lost track of him. Prior to coming to see you today, I thought to myself, what's become of Joe? Because I knew he graduated and he went, he went, off, to, he went, went off to New York City as a banker. I thought, what has happened to Joe? So thanks to the internet, I was able to Google him. So I Googled Joe. I haven't talked to him in years. And sure enough, he pops up. He's a senior partner with a major law firm in New York City and Charlotte, North Carolina. And he does things like, he focuses on asset securitization, derivatives, banking, and finance. I don't, I don't know what any of that stuff is, right? <laughs> But you go through all of this and all of his honors and all the rest of it, and you get to the very bottom, his education. JD, Cornell University. MBA, Cornell University. BM Horn, Eastman School of Music, University of Rochester with a performance certificate. So I emailed him. I haven't talked to him in years. I said, wow, man, it's fantastic. I'm so proud of you. You really, you, you're doing it. He wrote me back. I said, I'm going to talk to the freshman at Eastman. He said, well, you know what? Tell them that passion and ability drive ambition. They can play the trumpet, and they can be the president of the University of Rochester. You can be an oboist. You'll have good read days and not good read days. And you may be the principal oboe with, with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and, and, and teach at the University of uh, Minnesota. It's gonna happen for you. I've seen it happen again and again and again. I've seen it happen with Chuck Dollenbach, who was a classmate of mine, who's the tubus with Cleveland, with the uh, Canadian brass. Jeff Beale, who, who I was his dean of students, Emmy and, and Grammy award-winning composer and arranger. John Sparrow, a bassoonist. I just pulled these out of a hat just before coming over. John Sparrow, bassoonist with an MBA's vice president and managing director of the Atlanta Symphony. Mindy Kaufman, who's a piccolo, piccolo with, uh, with New York Phil. Um, Maria Schneider, composer, arranger, multi-Grammy award winner. For those of you in jazz, you know who she is. Judy LeClaire, principal bassoon, New York Phil. Colleen Conway, professor of music education and chair of the, the graduate program at the University of Michigan in music education. Ron Carter, arguably the greatest jazz bassist alive who is one of us as an undergraduate and to whom we awarded an honorary doctorate last year. Charles Strauss, composer arranger for Annie, Bye Bye Birdie, Emmy Award winner. And on, Renee Fleming, and on it goes. It is on their shoulders that you stand. It is on their shoulders that you stand. And we have such utter and complete confidence that this is the place for you, that the the letter in the thin envelope that I still worry sometimes might come telling me that they, I'm not the Paul Brigitte they admitted, it hasn't come nor will it for you. Will you go into the fiery furnace? You will. Will you survive it? You will. And I promise you, Bailey, 25 years from now, you'll be standing on this stage and you'll be saying, there was this guy, we called him Dean Brigitte, and he said, passion and ability drive ambition. Passion and ability drive ambition. We're so glad you're here, and good luck for a wonderful four years.
Now off to the practice rooms in the classroom. A production of the University of Rochester. Please visit us online and subscribe to our channel for more videos.